Bonjour à toutes et bonjour à tous, je suis ici avec euh, Brie qui a notamment travaillé chez Ubisoft sur Assassin's Creed et Child of Light. Brie, nice to have you here in Paris. Uh, can you introduce yourself and tell us uh, what you're doing in the video game industry? Sure, uh, my name is Brie Code and I've been in the video game industry for 15 years. I run a small, tiny little mobile studio in Berlin called True Love Media and before that I used to work in AAA like you said at Ubisoft and before that at Relic Entertainment in Vancouver making RTS games. So uh, you started uh, your, uh, your career as an AI programmer mm -hmm. yeah, at uh, Relic Entertainment on Pandemic Studio. Yeah. Can you tell us uh, how did you end up being a, a programmer, on an AI programmer yeah. in uh, this studio? Um, I studied computer science in university because I knew I could get an A in it. I was paying my own way through university and um, I had a scholarship and I wouldn't I would have to drop out if I lost the scholarship so computer science was a way for me to get a degree. Um, I also really liked the like the puzzles involved in like making like s puzzling through algorithms and, and 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 then I got really interested in like large scale software design and architecting big systems is is kind of there's a beauty to it. Um, I became interested in AI because I'm really interested in characters in video games. Yeah. And uh, then, so you went in Relic Entertainment on Pandemic Studio. Can you yeah. speak to uh, tell us about uh, these two experiences? Yeah, so um, I wasn't planning to work. I didn't know that video games could be a job back then. It was a long time ago. Um, it wasn't known. It, well, there weren't programs at school for video games and, and things like that. So after I got my computer science degree, I kind of had a little panic. And I was like, actually, I don't like it was the dot-com crash and there weren't any jobs left and I didn't want to go work at a bank it's not me um, and instead I ran away traveling and came back with no answers I thought I would find some answers and I had none I just had debt so I needed a job and I started applying for every job I could and I was so lucky that the first place that offered me a job was a game studio it was Relic and like from the first few weeks working there I knew that I'd found the thing that I would do. I loved the team so much, I loved the work so much, yeah. So what did you do back then? Um, I started um, writing gameplay code and um, UI code, um, tools, and then AI for Warhammer 40k and um, Company of Heroes. So if you've played Company of Heroes against the PC, you're playing against me and one of my colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> Is it difficult to, uh, to be against all the players? <laughs> um, I can't beat my own AI. <laughs> Actually, I could make it to like level 3 or something. So. so it means that you've done an AI which is way more intelligent than yourself. <laughs> or, or clicks faster, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it can help. Yeah. Uh, then you move to Pandemic Studio to be also an AI programmer, if yes. I'm right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. On a project that unfortunately didn't get finished. Yeah, so you can't talk about it, I guess. Right, yeah. <laughs> But can you tell us uh, how your role evolved over time during all these years at Relic Entertainment on yeah. Pandemic Studio doing AI, pr AI programming? Yeah, um, I mean, at, at Relic, I learned more in the three and a half years at Relic than I learned doing my degree, like about how to structure large systems and, and processes for making games. And then I had the chance to go to Pandemic, which was, you know, when you're in one studio, you never know what are the things that are kind of games industry standard and what are the things that just your studio does. So going to a second studio gave me tons of perspective of like what, what kind of things work across different teams and what kind of things are specific to one team. Um, And, and also making games with different sizes of teams, different cultures. Um, then, but then I got the chance to go 
work on Assassin's Creed at Ubisoft and I really loved Assassin's Creed 1 so that was like a huge dream for me. Yeah. And when you moved to Ubisoft I saw on your LinkedIn that you became manager. Like you came you became you come from programming which is a very technical side and you just became manager. Yeah. How did you handle this transition? Oh my gosh. <laughs> It was so intimidating. I had no idea why they offered me they so when I got to Ubisoft Um, my boss said like oh we're gonna just do some casual like splitting the team up into some teams and would you like to run f one for one cycle and, and I thought it was just something we're all taking turns doing and I was like okay and then when the cycle was over he was like would you like to be the manager of this team and I was like of course I'm gonna say yes because um, so it's a promotion teams. right and and I I just knew like you're supposed to say yes to things like that but I was so intimidated and terrified by it and I was so shy back then so I used to like have to write down exactly what I, like my team of like six people I would have to write down what I would say to them for the meeting in the morning because every morning I would get so nervous that my mind would go blank and I couldn't remember what I was going to say to my own team that I know like we go out for lunch together like all the time like we're, we're friends but standing up in front of them I would get really nervous so it took a, a lot of years to be comfortable with that role but I just kept trying yeah so you became a great programmer and a good manager I, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> you hope so <laughs> my um, I, I think that learning management was really special because the things you learn as a manager are applicable in all areas of your life so like like how to inspire people how to bring a team together how to organize things how to t manage time all of these kind of things are stuff you can use every part of your life so it, it changed my life being a manager yeah. as a manager uh, uh, w were you still working on uh, AA uh, on the in Assassin's Creed? Yeah. Yes. So my team on Assassin's Creed were responsible for what was called systemic AI. So it was AI systems. Yeah. Okay, so still AI. Yeah. 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 So uh, uh, Assassin's Creed is a really big triple A. So it's still a big step between uh, really on pandemic on I think uh, Ubisoft Assassin's Creed. Yes. Uh, so what can you tell us about this period of your life? You know, this feeling of working of a huge. Uh, lessons uh, which has a lot millions of fans around the world I never thought about the number of fans but like I knew I'd wanted to work on Assassin's Creed because my little brother liked it and it was a big deal and like I had loved the art direction on the first game particularly um, but it, it I never really thought about like the impact in the world I was just th like I really liked being a part of this big team that's like it's like a well-oiled machine everything is functioning and you just you you're like like part of something big and and but it's the energy of the people around me that I really liked and then it wasn't until the end of brotherhood I was running through the metro like one evening um, rushing somewhere and I turned a corner and there was a life-size poster of Assassin's Creed Brotherhood like it, huge in the metro and I it, that's when I realized that what we're making is really like huge <laughs> yeah and I hadn't really thought about it up to that point and then I started to think about the responsibility that we have and I, I made some changes in my career so uh, at this point uh, you're still working on Assassin's Creed uh, uh, Revelations and then uh, uh, Assassin's Creed Revelations just um, two and Brotherhood and three yeah so uh, After that, uh, after this, it changed your point of view. So, did you work uh, differently after that on Assassin's Creed 3? Um, yeah, on Assassin's Creed 3, I was just trying harder to um, do initiatives for women in games and, and improve representation. And because there there had been a woman on Assassin's Creed Brotherhood who had done a lot of work to make sure that there would be women in the Brotherhood, okay. um, and I was really impressed by her. Um, So, uh, she inspired you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah, seeing that poster and realizing how important it was. And, um, so um, that's why I moved on to Child of Light after, yeah. Yeah, you were the lead programmer of Child of Light. Yeah. Child of Light is a game we liked very much here. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We loved it uh, when it came out. Uh, yeah. It's beautiful and uh, great to play, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. it's, it's the only game I've made that I've finished. Yeah, because normally by the time we, I finish a game production, I like, don't want to really look at the game anymore. Like I've already been looking at it for two years solid. But Child of Light I finished m many times, actually. I played through it a number of times. 
Yes, so China Flight was kind of a, uh, the indie game inside Ubisoft. It was their marketing, yeah. you know, yes. <laughs> with yeah. uh, Valiant Arts also, yes. yeah. which was made in Montpellier in France. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's a game we liked very much. Uh, from your internal point of view, uh, how was it, was it a, an indie production within Ubisoft? Like, so with a lot of people. <laughs> uh, yes. Was it cool? How was it? Oh, it was amazing. It was like my favorite game that I've shipped so far. Um, the team, it was the first time I got to hire the whole team from nothing so um, I I had noticed that the most challenging teams I'd worked on had been teams where there'd been like a lot of an in-group where people were quite similar coming from the same background or something so for Child of Light I wanted to see what would happen if I built a team from as many different backgrounds as I could so I hired people from inside the company from outside um, in Quebec, language is quite politicized, so I hired a mix of francophones and anglophones. Um, I tried to hire a mix of ages, mix of levels of experience, every aspect I could. I tried to get as many women as possible. Um, and the team had the highest morale of any team I've ever worked with. Like, we were just, like, it was a really speci special production, yeah. How many people in the team? Um, on the programming team, we were 13. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Is it Still a little inside Ubisoft. <laughs> For example, uh, how many people in programming team in Assassin's Creed, if you know? <laughs> um, I'm not sure, but I think on Assassin's Creed 3, just in the AI team, we were 60. Okay. <laughs> so it's I huge. <laughs> something like that. Uh, yeah. So, uh, can you share with us like a, a, a really good memories about, about uh, Child of Light production oh. that you have? Um, <laughs> the, I think one of my favorites is when we decided to do the hair and the Jeff, the programmer who came up with the fluid, like we, what we did, we ended up like, um, ended up doing like a mix of 2D and 3D to get the hair and the feel right um, for how she turned and, and how the hair moved. And so we were running like a, a fluid simulation on the screen and the hair was moving in that and that was in two dimensions, but then she was in three dimensions for her animation. Um, and so, Jeff kind of, I was like, oh, we can't fit that in the schedule, like manager, boss. And, and then so Jeff just like did it secretly without telling me and then showed me. And then I was like, okay. And then we ended up spending months and months on it. But he showed me an early prototype very quick. And I was like, okay, like we have to do it. It's so beautiful. And it, it really was. It, it has yeah. a kind of magic about it. Where, because she's flying. So the air, when she turns around, it's, uh, it's part of the magic about it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. W was it good to, to work on the UB Art Engine? Because yeah. it, it's, uh, yes, yeah. from the programming side, because I'm a programmer too, yeah. and I always wonder, you know, when Michel Ancel said, like years ago, <laughs> that he wanted the UB Art to be a free engine, but we can yeah. experiment. I was yeah, yes. On He's doing really cool stuff now too. Have you seen, like, with his other studio that's on the side? The, I was in Morocco this time last year, and Michel Ancel gave a talk about the engine they're using at the, at the studio, and it's like, oh my god, yeah. it's a really great tool. He told people about that in Indicate Europe last year too. Yeah, so yeah. really impressive. Yeah. yeah, still ones, but I think he needs some maybe some Polish to be before building Grizzlies because yes. it's an Italian engine. So. more yes. complex than uh, UbiArt, I think. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But really visionary, I think. What were you working on uh, specifically on the programming uh, of Child of Lights? Um, I think when we started, we were only three programmers, so I was I was coding as well. When we grew bigger, then I was just managing. But um, I think I... What did I write? I think I wrote the inventory, I think, yeah. Okay, so then you left Ubisoft yeah. because uh, for many reasons, I think. I wanted, to make, I wanted to make little tiny different games for people who don't like the games. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on it told us uh, at the talk you gave at the Indicate Europe uh, 2017 that there are a lot of things you, f you feel that are wrong in this industry. Yeah. So what, what can you tell us about all this? Um, so around the time that I was working on Child of Light, I had always just taken for granted that my friends don't like video games, and I do. And we like everything else. Like, we like the same movies, we like the same artists, same music. But I just thought, like, I'm a little bit more of a geek than them. And sometimes I, like, try to show them games and they're not interested, and they don't even understand why I work in games. They're just so not interested. 
But then something happened around the time that tablets started to become really common and that um, everyone who was a gamer was like updating to the new console generation um, and giving their old consoles to people. A lot of my friends who had never showed any interest in games at all, all started to come to me separately, independently, not knowing that they were doing this and ask about games for the first time with curiosity and not with disgust. And I started to like do little tests and see what they would say about certain games. And it blew my mind in the end. Um, my cousin, who is one of my best friends and, and someone who is really, 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 really not interested in games, <laughs> I actually got her playing Skyrim. And one day she called me crying. I didn't know she was actually playing it. I just tried to suggest she should play it. And one day she called me and she was crying because she had killed Lydia. It's like a character in the game. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> Lydia is a character who joins you and follows you around, and she doesn't say much. But like in her silence, there's a lot of characterization, um, and but you can also like really easily accidentally kill her, okay. like because she gets in the way. She's a she's a melee fighter, so like when you're fighting someone, she's like fighting them too, and you accidentally kill her, especially if you're not really interested in combat and you're not good at it. So she can die, yeah. Yeah, um, and. In that conversation, what my cousin was telling me um, blew my mind. One of the things she said was that all these years, it wasn't that she didn't like video games, it was that she didn't know what they could be. Yes. Um, and I started to look into the, the patterns of what my friends were saying about games, and, and there isn't any games that suit them. There's, like, she stopped playing Skyrim pretty shortly after because it's a really, like, violent medieval game she's not interested in that stuff at all um, but she caught a glimpse of what games could be that would interest her and no games like that exist and as I was asking more and more and I started doing focus groups with women of all ages and and talking with many people who don't like video games I started to see all these patterns and then I found out that like, not to get too technical, but game design is kind of built on the fight or flight reaction to stress. We manage, uh, uh, like, all kind of games, like, like a mobile game is like management of like keeping you perfectly frustrated and perfectly rewarded. And this depends on the idea that we respond to stress with adrenaline and dopamine. But it turns out that like a lot of people have a completely different biochemical reaction to stress that game design has completely ignored. Um, and this other reaction opens up the door for different types of gameplay that aren't supported by our current theories of game design. And that's why I made my company to, to explore those things. So uh, you, tell, you told uh, at your keynote that uh, indicates that you uh, the oxytocin is uh, released in the body with caring uh, or, or something like that. that it, it's not violence or fear or that yes. are usually uh, used <laughs> in video games. Uh, so uh, how can you uh, ex explore, uh, <laughs> you explore this, uh, this feeling in video games by game design? What are your um. ideas? Uh? So this other stress response is called tend and befriend. And like you said, it's, it's involved with oxytocin and opioids in kind of a loop of, so tending is taking care of things. It's like doing the gardening, um, feeding pets, um, cleaning, like so doing puzzles where the puzzle starts out really messy and then by the time you're done the puzzle, it's really neat and tidy. Puzzles are satisfying to some people because you're solving the puzzle, but to other people it's satisfying just because you're like tidying it. Um, and, and then befriending is the other half, which is forming alliances. Gathering, gathering up the people that depend on you and making sure that you have allies against your common enemies. Um, so these are things that stimulate people that are wired with this kind of stress reaction in video games. So this is why my cousin liked Skyrim and this is why I like Skyrim because there's characters that you can like get to know and you can help sort out all of their dramas and like take sides with them against like this terrible other people in the world and um, and you can like organize things, you can collect things, bring them home, organize them. Like these kind of behaviors are very stimulating to people who are wired this way. So uh, to expose uh, this kind of game design. You founded your own studio at Berlin. It was called True Love, the yeah. True Love Media. So, uh, uh, what a name. What, what a name, <laughs> exactly. And what kind of games uh, do you want to make? 
Um, uh, so because I found this research because I just talked to someone who didn't like video games, and it like it's it's incredible to me. Like I just talked to someone who doesn't like video games, and then discovered some theory that kind of implies that game design is really wrong or incomplete, incomplete. So yes, so. Um, I find extreme value in talking to people who don't like video games. So in my studio, each game that we make is co-designed with someone who doesn't like video games. So each game is very different from each other one because what I do is work with the person to design a game that maybe they would like. So we start from something that's in their heart, like um, what is something that they really don't like about life? Or what is something that they really like about life? Or what is something that they wish they could tell the world? Something that is burning inside of their heart. And, and, and how can we turn that into a world? And, and what are the rules of that world? And who's in that world? And, and how do those rules convey this meaning? And, and then from there, we choose some game mechanics that convey all of that. And we make a game out of it. On the Right now, in 2017, uh, have you already success to do this? And if, <laughs> and if yes or if not yet, yes. could, can you uh, explain us uh, why or give us like a concrete example of this? Sure. So, um, I just got my tax number in Germany like two weeks ago, even though I applied in August because a lot of paperwork. In fr in France too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So just the beginning of the, uh, the, beginning of the company, but um, I have an. I have one game almost finished. Um, I've just, I made a Patreon for my company because we're doing R&D work and I don't want to have to worry about profitability of the games at first because I want to be able to experiment so that we can find something that really resonates with people instead of like, if people aren't gamers yet, it's because games aren't stimulating them. And it will take some experimentation to find what does stimulate them. So I want room for that experimentation. So I'm trying crowdfunding and things like this to, to, keep, the, to keep it going. Um, so I've just released our first little app just to our Patreon subscribers um, today, actually. Um, and that app is a little teaser of the first game which will come out I think for January but I've never released a game on my own before so I'm sure I'm going to mess it up but um, we're, Can we're you tell us about this teaser sure so um, the game itself the one that will come out in January is called hashtag self care and it's inspired by and designed by Eve Thomas she's a magazine editor and artist in Montreal and she's very interested in themes of self care and gender roles and how they relate and especially on the internet and self-care has kind of been a trend like picking up speed on tumblr and instagram and when she first heard about it she really didn't like it she was like why do people need an excuse to take a bubble bath and then she was like people need an excuse to take a bubble bath like they should have an excuse so we she was really you know touched by the fact that people feel so much pressure that they're not taking basic care of themselves and so the game is a place for taking care of yourself. It's sort of a Tamagotchi meets WarioWare, but with no time pressure. You have a character in the game. As you take care of the character, you also take care of yourself. Um, and so the first little app, the one that we released today, is just a tiny little glimpse of one of the mini games in that game. And it's just a breathing, breathing interaction. So you're talking a lot of about uh, self-care, love, meditation. Yes. Is are all these subjects really you know, true to your art? It seems to be. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think because um, there could be, like, we could all take care of ourselves and each other a lot more. Why are we so confrontational with each other, so competitive? I don't think it's leading us into good places in society. I, I think, like, as the internet changes the world, and the internet is changing the world in, in huge ways, in ways that we can't even begin to comprehend yet, but we're all so in each other's faces now, and we're all so connected. Um, global warming is destabilizing a lot of things. We're all gonna, you know, we need to put aside our differences and learn to work together with all of our unique strengths to build a future that we would all want to be in. It's a great way of seeing things. And, uh, that includes uh, video games. So yes. th they cannot be excluded. Uh, yes. How does that mean? I mean, in video games, video games are huge. Um, and video games will only become bigger. Like, as, as 
interactivity becomes the standard, like interactive entertainment will become the standard form of entertainment if we rise to the occasion and make things that everyone likes. Um, but so in, in vid video games are extremely powerful. Like if you can imagine it, we can make it in a video game. Like we can program anything. We're not limited by like what a camera can do or how a person can act. Like, and soon we're gonna like in ten years or something. Are we gonna all be wearing AR like implanted in our eye, and the whole world is going to be this kind of experience? Play is how we naturally learn. I think it could be how we work. I think that video games can become a huge part of our daily lives all the time, in this like mixed. AR, VR world that we'll live in, um, like, and we can create what worlds we want. We can imagine the future we want, and we can create it in video games. I hope we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're also talking a lot about the, the place of a woman in the video game industry. Yes. It's a uh, it's a real interesting subject because, mm -hmm. like I said earlier, I'm so programmer. Well, I'm young, so I don't have at all your experience. <laughs> But I have like five or six years of experience and I quite never saw a programming woman. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, in your opinion, why? <laughs> um, uh, is there any way to, to improve to improve it? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not a... Solve this problem. Yeah, to, to change this. It, there's so many small things that add up to this problem and so it needs to be fought on many fronts. Um, But there's research about why it exists. Um, at Carnegie Mellon University in the 90s, Jane Margolis and her colleagues um, talked to a lot of young women who studied or dropped out of or chose not to study computer science and, and kind of looked at the reasons and devised three simple changes to their computer science program um, that ended up changing their enrollment numbers with these just these simple changes, um, dramatically improving their enrollment numbers up to 40-something percent, same as all the other sciences, from under 10 percent. And then recently, Harvey Mudd College in California replicated those same results with the same three changes, also going from under 10 percent enrollment to above 40 percent enrollment. And this is called the BRAID Initiative, coordinated by the Anita Borg Institute. Um, and um, it, it identifies the problems that cause the one of the things that causes this imbalance and the three changes are just um, to be welcoming to show context and to show role models so they they split up the introduction to computer science class into two so there's one for self-taught experts and one for people who don't know anything yet um, and they teach the same difficulty of material it's just like one it doesn't assume you already know things um, in the introductory course, the, the true introductory course, they also give context to what computer science can be used for because um, women tend to want to choose careers where they think they can help the world in some way. And when computer science programs are taught where they just dive right into like fun to solve abstract programming problems, women tend to think like, yeah, but what am I doing with this? So they just give some context. You can see what are the interesting problems that have been solved, haven't been solved yet, how does this impact other industries and impact people's lives and then the third is they send young women in the and they do a, they do, they also do a project right after the first year so you can really see what you can do with it so it's not just abstract um, and then um, they send young women in the program to a conference for women in tech just so they can see like when they're in their 30s and they have this career what will their lives look like what does it actually look like because there's no one in tv like there's no like mindy project for a you know 30 something computer programmer woman so it's just to give a visual and just with those three changes you get the same as other disciplines so it's nothing to do with computer science itself it's to do with how we teach it it's a culture yeah Yeah. So we can change it. <laughs> yes, we can. Yeah. Change culture, but it's a uh, difficult and a long process. <laughs> That's why it's difficult because yes. it's long and you have to change many things. Yeah. And change people's hearts. Yes. Yeah. On their way of thinking also, yes. because yeah. in every is in everybody's thinking like yes. women don't do computer science. Yes. Yeah. The, it's interesting. I, I'm living in Berlin now, and someone was telling me that in East Germany, I think it was in East Germany. Was it in Poland? Some like previously communist areas, math is considered women's work because you do it at home to balance the, the economy of the home. Okay. Yeah, so it's... And in Iceland, I think women do better at math than men in the like high school tests. So it's, like, it's very cultural. Yeah. 
Estland is one of the uh, countries that is more equality between uh, men and women in Iceland. There are a lot of things in Iceland we should be inspired by. <laughs> in northern uh, countries uh, in, in general. <laughs> yeah. And there is also that in, in the, our representations, we don't see many women playing games or working on uh, computer sciences or, or even uh, working on computer at all. There is, in the people representations, we see more uh, women caring uh, on things like that. Just those kind of things must be changed. The, my understanding of tendencies and gender is that like, you can have the concept of masculinity and femininity and men tend to have some traits, women tend to have some traits, but when you look at the actual populations, they overlap much more than they're different. So even when I talk about tend and befriend as a stress reaction, the reason that it wasn't discovered for so long was because early stress research was only done on male rats. In humans, it's a big mix. Like many men respond with tend and befriend. Many women respond with fight or flight. It can be contextual which one is your response in different times. Um, but we do, as a games industry, we do ignore the feminine a lot. That uh, makes me think about uh, a totally different subjects. It's about a uh, heart attack. Uh, heart attack symptoms are really different uh, between uh, men and women, and uh, we all know uh, only know the symptoms on men. So uh, when a woman has a uh, uh, heart attack, we don't know uh, because uh, with, the, with a man, it's, uh, it starts with the arm, and the, with a woman, absolutely not. So uh, yeah. that's why uh, more women dies of uh, heart attack. Yeah, that's a great example. And that those, because we're tending often to do medical research and neuroscience research and psychological research, many types of research on male animals because they don't have that messy menstruation, then we miss a lot of what works for a lot of humans. But I think now time are moving. Well, maybe not yes. as fast as we'd like, but the time are moving on. It's, we are yes. talking way on way, way more about these yes. subjects. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about uh, all these movements on, uh, in the video game industry? Is, yeah. Do you feel that something is moving too? Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, I think like the, the video game industry faces a lot of challenge right now because the... So when I started in the video game industry, you had to go work at a big studio. Engines didn't really exist. Like when I worked on Company of Heroes, we spent three years writing the engine, and then six years, uh, six months making the game, and then it shipped. So um, it was a three and a half year production, but it was because we made the engine. Um, now. We have great engines that anyone can pick up, a range of them, depending on your level of programming knowledge or not. Um, and anyone can make a game. And this means that there's a lot of competition and it's really hard for indies to get noticed and to be able to have a chance to develop their skills enough to make their vision. Um, but it also means that it's democratized a lot and people with a wide range of ideas of what games should be, all people, have access to trying to make them and that's pushing the industry forward and it's beautiful. In France we also have, uh, I don't know if you heard about it, but uh, the Women in, Game in, Women in Games Association yeah. which has been created like some months ago. Yeah. And, uh, uh, do you think that this kind of uh, association can help to, uh, to spread the world? Uh Definitely, I think so. I mean I'm coming from Montreal and in Montreal there's a group called Pixels and they um, teach workshops to young women um, about how to make games and do a lot of initiatives and, and they have a real impact in the community and in, in the number of women getting interested in games. Yeah. One of the first uh, actions of uh, women in games uh, in France is to uh, actually have uh, one of these work workshops in, in Paris Games Week uh, this week. Uh, and uh, there is also at another city in France uh, and at the same time. It's a It's the first time we see something like that. Uh, it's uh, promising. It's really cool. Very cool, yeah. Uh, and do you think that there is uh, other uh, games that tend to achieve what you want to, to do uh, uh, that tends to be the, the games that, uh, that could please other people that are, are different and that with caring and, and things like that? I think that it's a big movement in games right now, the idea of compassion in games or care in games. Um, but still, because it's such a, like, it's not just like a small part of 
what we could do that we're missing. Like we're missing so many different directions we could go. Like so much we could do with characters, so much we could do with narratives, so much we could do with AI, so much we could do with tone and meaning and different and comedy. Like there's so many different directions missing from games right now that um, even though there's kind of many people moving in very interesting directions, a lot of my friends still don't have any games that are right for them. And so I think there's just so much opportunity. And this makes me think that we've talked about women uh, in games, yeah. but what about women that are really in games and the character? This is also moving a lot because yeah. 10 years ago there was almost no woman character, some, but really few. There was a yeah. Lara Croft, but she was just kind of uh, a male character turning to a woman with yes. his song and, and uh, independence, was. but uh, she's uh, in a... Uh, Action game. Uh. She is a bimbo. <laughs> yeah, but there was there was uh, Jad from Beyond Good and Evil. Yes. Uh, some characters, but yeah. very few. Now we're seeing on, many. On, on in 2017, uh, I wonder if uh, if there is more uh, woman uh, games with a woman hero. Or oh, maybe. Yeah. Well, I think but we've just like we've so we've just. I don't know whether they're playable characters or not. The women that were just in the Last of Us trailer today. And then there was the there was the Uncharted DLC, I think it was. And Horizon, Horizon Zero Dawn. Yes, yes, yeah. And um, so there's definitely, I think, I think AAA companies are really um, experimenting in this space and, and seeing what they can do. And, and I, I I think it's great. For you, uh, how? Yeah, El Blade also. Uh, for you, uh, how was it uh, to work with a, a woman in Shadow of Light? It was aura, so it was a child on a woman, so it's, yes. it's quite unusual in the video game industry. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. I mean, I would like to work with any characters that aren't the same one that we're all bored of. Like, so I would love to see different depictions of masculinity. I would love to see characters of all genders, all different kind of personalities. Definitely I would like to see a lot more um, racial diversity among characters in video games. Okay. There's a lot of things to do. Uh, a game that uh, could be uh, the closest to what we want, you want to achieve, I think it could be Journey. Yeah, uh, so that's, uh, it, that's interesting that you say that because Journey is one of my favorite games. And when my cousin first asked about games before she played Skyrim, she played Journey. And I thought that Journey would be the perfect fit for her from what I knew about what was out there in games and what was possible in games because... It's a game that is self-referential. It's a game about what games are. It's a game about, you know, the, what we can... And anyway, she loves contemporary art, and that's very much about, like, self-referentiality. So I thought she would love Journey and totally get it, and that it would be like, suddenly she'd be like, oh, I get games are the future of art, and it's amazing. But she didn't like it. Um, and <laughs> um because there's a snake that can kill you and it pulled her out of the experience she's so uninterested in being attacked and that was like that was really the first moment where i became intrigued and like it wasn't that it was too hard she's just not even interested she doesn't want to learn to overcome that she doesn't want to be attacked at all she's not interested in it um and so that that part of journey pulled her out of it enough that she didn't continue and it that's when I started to realize how much the space that is unexplored is because we think like oh games are moving in this great like that was many years ago when it came out and we were like games are moving in this great direction and they are but that like for someone like my cousin that's still not good enough it's not for her and so there's so much opportunity yeah. Yeah. the first person you ever met that doesn't like journey <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's really interesting, like you said, uh, we don't realize how um, wide is uh, the, the specter of uh, possibility that we have to explore in, uh, in games. And that uh, it needs a lot of creativity to uh, put down a game design that would fit in, uh, in those areas. Because uh, you have to, uh, this game. Uh, the dream game we could uh, must have to uh, to appeal gamers and non-gamers as well. well but the, the secret to that is to just bring the people who you're trying to target into the process this is like a well-known design technique from outside of games 
um, when you want, like if you read books about how to run a startup and they talk about customer development, they're talking about like working really closely with your target audience because you don't need to guess what they would like. You can just get them to do it. So that's, that's why like um, the best, most creative teams, research shows that the most creative teams are teams of people who are a mix of different backgrounds and different interests. So a mix of experienced game developers and people who know nothing about games would make very creative games. Yeah. Okay, okay thank you. So one uh, last question that has nothing to do with yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all the subjects we discussed before. It's a yeah. question we always ask to, to everyone okay. because it's interesting to have different points of view. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, what do you think of the video game industry in your country? So for you, I guess it's Germany. Yeah. And uh, uh, what do you think about the video game industry in France, if yes. you have one, as we are French? Yes. <laughs> well, um, I'm new in Europe, so I haven't had that much, much that many chances to explore. Um, I chose Berlin because I like the video game industry there. Um, for the kind of games I want to make, there's a lot of mobile game studios in Berlin, and I want to make mobile games as well. The games industry in Berlin is very well rounded, and people um, have a lot of interests outside of games. In Berlin, the art scene is really prevalent. I think it's the same in Paris. I think. Um, there's a lot of connection between like games and other forms of media and comics and 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 kind of interesting new kinds of stuff on all fronts. Um, and you know, being ex Ubisoft, I I know a little bit about the French games industry from that side, and I've always been like really impressed with what's like with with uh, the studios in France. Um, under the Ubisoft umbrella, particularly, I always enjoyed working with the Montpellier Studio. They were, when we were working with UB Art on Child of Light, um, the team in Montpellier were so helpful to us and really generous with sharing their knowledge about the engine. And 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 so, yeah. yeah. Where, where do you come from? Where where are you born? If I may ask. Vancouver. Okay. Yeah. So in Vancouver, I guess it's completely different to the video <laughs> game industry. Um, I think it's collapsed a lot there. It might be growing again now, but around 2008, like it started to contract because Vancouver is a very expensive city. Okay. Um, but I think it's growing again now, and I, I think it's growing in really interesting directions. But it's too expensive for me in Vancouver. I couldn't make it as an indie there. So, uh, so there were uh, Rockstar Studio, but it uh, it's been closed. It's been closed. It was uh, the studio that, uh, that made uh, Max Payne free, <laughs> but it's, it moved on on Tor Toronto. Okay. So, yeah. so I, don't I don't know any other uh, Vancouver studio actually. <laughs> there was a huge EA studio there when I started, oh, yeah. but it closed in I don't know a few years later. Um, there was, yeah, it's it's a long time going back. A, a number of studios have closed there, but I, I think there's a number that have opened up there as well. Vancouver is really beautiful. You should go one day <laughs> if you can, um, but bring an we'll umbrella. Be. Bring an umbrella if you ever oh, go to Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we used to, to rain <laughs> in, France, in France, in Paris. It's okay. Okay, thanks a lot, Brie, for this interview. It was very interesting. Very nice time talking to you. And a good luck with all your new projects because it's very ambitious. So Thank you. We'll, you will need. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Support. Thank yeah. you. Uh, have a good time in Paris. I, will. I love Paris. I've been eating so many pastries. <laughs> okay, so enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.